appreciate the Sunday night service here at Cleveland Baptist Church. And I don't want to ever take for granted the fact that folks make an effort to get back here. I know that it's right to do that, but I also know that it's sometimes it takes an effort. And a lot of places, again, today, I'm, I'm not necessarily, I can't control every place. But I want to tell you that I, I think the Sunday night service is just so essential uh, to us as God's people being together and just being encouraged. You're going to go out and face the world tomorrow. Many of you will be going out into the world and dealing with the, the aspects of the world. And uh, the only thing that you have to counterbalance that is your personal devotions. But God has specifically designed the church and the meeting of the church and the preaching of his word to help us to grow in grace and to become all that God wants us to be so that we can face that world and deal with it in a very positive way and impact it rather than impacting us. And that's really what the Sunday night service is all about, as well as all the other services that are scheduled. And I just think to myself down through the years of how many church services I've been in from the time I can remember. And uh, Sunday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, midweek services, conferences and revivals and things that I've attended. And I've never been hurt by any of it. Can you imagine? Not a bit of it's ever hurt me. It's nothing done but help me in my Christian life and my Christian walk. And I'm very grateful for that. Thank the Lord for the fact that you're here tonight. Take your Bible. Let's go to the book of Revelation. When I get back into the book of Revelation, hopefully some on Sunday nights when I'm preaching and it's my turn to preach. And we're in Revelation chapter 5 tonight. Revelation chapter 5 for the guests that are here. Uh, we have started uh, to kind of traverse our way through this book. And we're preaching chapter by chapter, verse by verse, section by section. And many folks have an interest in the book of Revelation because it talks about things that are yet to happen. And, uh, of course, when we look at the book, it's divided into those things that were, the things that are, and the things that are yet to come. And we're now in that section of things that are yet to come. And so we're looking at that, and uh, I want us to begin here in verse number 5 here. I'm sorry, verse number 1 tonight, and we're going to read down to verse number 6 for our text. I really wanted to cover this entire chapter, but the older I get, the longer it takes me to get through things. And so rather than just kind of rush through it, I wanted to take our time and we'll do with the first six verses tonight. If you're able to and you can stand, would you please stand as we give reverence to God's word? And I want to speak to you tonight on a, on a sealed book and a redeemer. A sealed book and a redeemer. Revelation chapter 5, please, beginning in verse number 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book. He saw a book. He said, I saw him sitting on the throne and he had in his right hand a book. Written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy? Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Notice please verse 3. And no man, and no man in heaven, nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book and neither to look thereon. Well, John had a response to that, verse number 4. And he said, And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. Now, our Heavenly Father, we are grateful tonight for this service and for this meeting. And how grateful we are for the songs of Zion that have been sung tonight. But Lord, we are pausing at this moment as we're preparing to preach. To once again ask you, Lord, for your divine anointing upon our life and upon this message. Lord, I want this passage to come to life for our church tonight. I want them to see it. I want them to sense it. I want, to, I want it to be as if they're transported, Lord, to heaven to behold, Lord, what you allowed John to see and allowed him to write so that we could be a, a part of it. Someday in the future, Lord, we will be there. What a moment that will be. But right now, Lord, we have to anticipate we have to envision, and the Word of God is designed to do that for us. So help us tonight. Holy Spirit of God, do a great work here, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. So in some respects, I, I kind of have to apologize in the sense that it's been a while since we've been in the book of Revelation. We have to go back to really to the month of November of last year and, and when we preached our last message. And in that message, we dealt with the fourth chapter 
And here's, here's what I want to point out to you. If you look, if you would, at the first verse, uh, and the first word of the first verse in chapter 5, you'll find the word and. Okay. So here, here's what we need to understand. Many times when we look at the Bible, and I, you've heard me say this before as your pastor and teaching and doing some preaching here from this pulpit, that many times we, we allow these chapter and verse divisions kind of cut off our thinking or linking them together. Now, we understand that when God inspired the word, he didn't inspire the chapter and the verse divisions. And there's nothing wrong with chapter and verse divisions. It helps us to obviously find a place and a text. But sometimes, because chapters obviously kind of are uh, right in the middle of a thought, sometimes they insert them, people quit reading and don't link a chapter that's previous or what's been said previously to what is now being said. So, so here's what I want you to understand is that in the fourth chapter, God had transported uh, John, who had been exiled on the Isle of Patmos, he, had, he said, now John, I want you to come up hither. And God allowed him in that spirit to be transported into the throne room of heaven. And of course, as he got there, he stood and we stood with him as we looked in chapter four and he began to see there in the throne of heaven how amazing a moment it must have been. As he saw this, this throne in the midst of heaven and him who sat upon it, the emerald throne and sur- surrounded by this emerald rainbow, and John was just mesmerized by it. And I have to tell you, ever since I, I preached that message back in November, God so stirred in my own heart that every time I get on my knees and every time I go to the Lord in prayer, I envision God upon his throne. You know, that's really what the Bible wants us to do. It wants us to see God as, as who he really is. And, and quite honestly, we're not given a physical description. The Bible doesn't give us that. It just talks about who he is and the power that emanates from that throne in the fourth chapter. And so as I see that, I'm seeing that he's, he describes that in the fourth chapter, and the fifth chapter also is in heaven, and we're still focused on the throne there as we open this chapter. And again, so as we think about that, I want you to go back, and if you need to turn back like I do in my Bible, one, uh, one page, but look if you would at chapter four and verse number one, and I want you to see that we get a hint of well, as John is in heaven, the, what's unfolding there is about, he, God is about ready to reveal some things. Revelation is, a, is the pulling back. If you want to know what the word means, it means to, to pull, pull back the drapes, the, to, to reveal something. And so revelation is a revealing. And so God has brought John into heaven to reveal the future. What's going to happen in the future? And, and look, if you would, at chapter 4 and verse number 1. It says, and after these things, after this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show you the things which, which must be hereafter. So these two chapters transport us there, and it is really the beginning of the revelation in which we're going to begin to see what the future holds. And we need to understand that tonight. So a proper understanding of, of this particular chapter is really critical in us understanding the rest of the book of Revelation. Dr. Lehman Strauss, who has been in heaven for a number of years, was a great Bible expositor, and he wrote this of this chapter. He said, quote, the importance of this chapter in the book of Revelation cannot, he said, it cannot be overemphasized. It contains the key to a right understanding of the rest of the book. If we err here, we will be wrong the rest of the way, end quote. So we're dealing with something that's critical in us understanding the rest of this book of Revelation. So when we think about that, when God takes John to heaven, I want you to understand that he's going to emphasize certain things, and he's going to allow him to experience certain things. And to honestly, to read what John experienced is thrilling, but can you imagine being John? Uh, I mean, this man who has for many years walked with the Lord, and he's given this, this opportunity and this experience to stand literally in the presence of God and to see these things, it must have been overwhelming. So I want you to understand when we think about this chapter, the fifth chapter, I want you to understand what it's really about. And I'm going to emphasize it right at this moment, and then we're going to spend the rest of our time together tonight looking at it. But this chapter is about the one. Listen to me. It's about the one and the only one who has the right to rule on this earth. Now, now we're going to talk a little bit about that. But I would tell you that there have been many men down through history who have longed to be a world ruler. In other words, there have been, if you go through the history of humanity, you will find a, a, a storyline, if you would, of, of human being after human being, man after man who has desired to conquer the world and to be a ruler. I, I just jotted down some. Some are found in the pages of Scripture. 
In the book of Genesis chapter 10, we find really, I think, the first man that had that desire. His name was Nimrod. And the Bible talks about him being a mighty hunter in the earth. And the beginning of his, of his kingdom was called Babel. And I believe that Nimrod was the first man who said, look, it's my desire. I want to rule the world. I, I want to be a conqueror. And so we, we read a little bit about him. And of course, we read in the book, Bible about the pharaohs that ruled over Egypt. And, and they were mighty men of power and, of course, conquerors and, and had great power. We, we certainly read in the Bible of a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar who had a desire to rule the world and to rule in Babylon as well. We read of a man by the name of Darius in the pages of Scripture who was a Persian and Cyrus as well. How, how about the name in history Alexander the Great, the, the great Grecian uh, conqueror who really wanted to go across the face of the, to, of, of the earth. And my understanding is that at the age of 33, he sat down and wept because he said there were no more kingdoms to conquer. So he was this mighty, mighty ruler, if you would, upon the face of the earth. And, and certainly we think of Nero, the Romans uh, in the Roman Empire, the emperors who sat upon the throne, and many of them had the title of Nero as this rule, world re, uh, leader. We, we are familiar in history of, of a man by the name of Genghis Khan, who also wanted to be a ruler, and we certainly know of Napoleon, the French conqueror. And of course, in recent history, the name Hitler uh, in the last century re resounds with us as a man who wanted literally to conquer the earth. So when we think about these men, here's what I want you to understand, that every one of those men had this desire to be this world leader, and really, quite honestly, behind that, that movement, behind that desire, really was a, an unsavory darkness. Now, I'm not saying all those men were necessarily terrible, terrible men, but many of them were. But quite frankly, when a man says, I want to rule the world, I want to sit upon the throne, I want the whole world to be accountable to me, I want to tell you there's a darkness behind that, because there's only one that has the right to rule. There's only one that has the right to the throne of the earth. And it's none of these men who are mentioned here. The final man who will have the desire to rule the earth is a usurper. And we will know him in the future as the Antichrist. That's obviously coming a little bit later here in our book and in our study. We haven't quite gotten to him yet, but his days are, are coming. And, and, and quite honestly, I, I'm going to give you a theory. I, I may have ex expressed it from this pulpit before. But I have been on the persuasion for a long time in my study of, of the Bible and my study of, of just history that because the devil does not know all of God's plan, he certainly has no clue about God's timeline, does he? Uh, the truth of the matter is the Bible says no man knows the day of the hour when Christ will come. So I believe from my perspective, from the days of Jesus, when, when, the, when the Bible says that Jesus ascended and the disciples stood there. They said, Lord, when are you going to establish your kingdom? He says, not, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father's put in his own power. And, and of course, not long after that, he ascended. He ascended up to heaven. And as they're standing there gazing, the, the disciples said, this same Jesus who you've seen go shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go. And of course, throughout the New Testament, we have this promise of the Lord's return. So his first advent was here to save us from our sins. His second advent is going to come as this, this great world ruler. But I've been on the persuasion that because the, the devil has always wanted to thwart God's plan, because he's always had a desire to, to undermine, and somehow, I don't know how the devil thinks this, but uh, he thinks somehow, some way, that he's going to be able to overthrow God's plan. He, he has in his mind that somehow, some way, that what God says in his Bible is not going to come to pass, that somehow he's going to be able to work it so that God can't accomplish it. What a foolish devil that he is. Honestly, uh, I don't say that lightly. I'm just sim simply saying that anybody who thinks that they can thwart the plan of an almighty God, there's something not right with them. And certainly there's not something not right with the devil. And so as I think about that, I think to myself that because he doesn't know the plan of God, I think the devil has always in his mind had a man that's ready to step in. I, I think he's always had someone who, if the Lord said, okay, it's time, I'm pulling my, I'm the plug on my earth, I'm pulling my people out, he's got a person ready to step in to fill this, this position that we know as the Antichrist that the Bible describes it. So here's what I would say to you tonight, because we don't know, I mean, honestly, I don't know when the, when the end is going to come. I don't know when the rapture is going to take place. I, I don't know when uh, the, the tribulation period is going to begin, but it could be this week. It could be tonight. And for that very reason, 
the Antichrist, that wicked one the Bible calls, the one uh, who, is, who is a distresser, a usurper, that one could be living someplace on this planet tonight. That's a, quite, quite an overwhelming thought if you stop to think about it. But that is very well could be. So as we think about, it's important for us to realize tonight that this chapter isn't about a false ruler, an Antichrist. This chapter is about the Christ. The right Christ, the, the, the right of Christ to be the lawful and righteous ruler of this earth. So the key to this chapter and the rest of Revelation is understanding, think about this, that when God created man, his name was, of course was Adam and he created his wife Eve as well or made his wife Eve as well. I want you to understand that you have to kind of understand that really from the book of Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation, we have what we call the crimson thread of redemption. Now, certainly man was not created sinful. He was created in innocency. And when God created man, God said to man, listen, he said, I want you to have, what did he call it? Dominion. He said, I want you to have dominion over the earth. I want you to rule over this earth. So it was God's desire that the the man that he created, Adam, in in the Garden of Eden, certain he gave him, he, he created him with life, and it was eternal at that moment. Because Adam wasn't supposed to die if he would have, if he had just not disobeyed God, he would still be alive tonight. And and he was a ruler. He was to rule over all God's creation. So he was to fellowship with God. He was to to have eternal life. And and God said, I'm giving you dominion over my earth. I want you to rule over this planet and everything that I've created. One problem is, is that there's a devil and there's Satan. The Bible's very clear that Satan stepped into God's creation. And as a result of that, he offered this bait, so to speak, this this deceit. The Bible says the woman was beguiled. She saw something. She sensed something. She thought something. And she disobeyed God. And because Adam loved his wife, I believe that his in willful disregard of what God said, he said, I love my wife. I'm going to also disobey God. And as a result of that, dominion was stolen or dominion was removed from man and then given over to the devil. Now, I want you to think about that tonight. Because the Bible calls in this this devil, he calls him the God of this world. So if you go to like the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 28, you'll read about the king of, of Tyrus. And you'll read about the prince of Tyrus. And it's interesting that there seemingly is in these various kingdoms, there are physical rulers and their spiritual wickedness that controls them. You know, we look around in our country tonight, and I, I have to tell you that there's evil in our country. There's, listen to me tonight, there's evil in our government tonight. There are those who totally disregard, totally hate the, the truth, they hate righteousness, they hate the things uh, that are right, and they're doing everything within their power to kick back and to push back, and I want to tell you that I believe that there's evil that's running rampant, and, and I, I'm not saying people are, are demon-possessed, I'm not saying that people are, 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 are contr- I'm saying they're controlled. And I'm saying tonight that in our government, in, in every government of the world, I think there's this evil that lurks that just wants to fight against that which is right. And so as I think about that, this chapter is about the one who came. And it's about the fact that God did something. This chapter is about the righteous God who became a man, who as man died and rose again to redeem fallen humanity. And he makes it possible for men once again, think about this, to have eternal life, to have peace and fellowship with God. That's really why Jesus Christ came. You see, when man fell, every one of us, because we are of human descent, because we come from that common ancestry, I don't care what your heritage is. I don't care if you're Polish or German or, or French here tonight. I don't, I don't care if, you're, if you say, well, I, I don't even know where my relatives came. As far as I'm concerned, I'm 100% American. I don't care what your heritage is here tonight. I don't care what your skin color is here tonight. It doesn't matter. We all go back to the same common ancestry. We go back to the Garden of Eden and, and a man by the name of Adam and his wife Eve. And as a result of that, we all have a fallen dem- a damnic nature that, that wants to resist the things of God. 
And, and as a result of that, we are born in this world, the Bible says, when, when we come with this desire to, to, to do our own thing, to live for our own purposes, and, and it's only as we understand that God sent his own son, Jesus Christ, into this world to take upon him flesh, and, and he never sinned one time because he didn't have the Adamic nature. He was born without the aid of a man. It, we believe in the virgin birth. We believe that Jesus had no physical human father. The Holy Spirit of God did the work in, in, in uh, uh, Mary's womb. And I'm here to tell you tonight, I don't care what the, uh, the, the, those folks who are Bible deniers say, I don't care what the modernists say, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, born into this world without the aid of any man. And because of that, he lived a sinless life. The Bible says he was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. And on the cross of Calvary, God did a great work. And the fact that he took the sins of humanity, he took your sins and my sins, and placed it upon his son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus, the Bible says, tasted death for every man. He paid the penalty. The wages of sin is death, and Jesus died, not because he's a sinner, but he died because for our sin, to pay our redemption and our, the price of our redemption. And I'm saying, here, if, as we sit here tonight and we think about that, at some point in your life, if you're saved tonight, there was a point when you understood your lost condition. You understood it wasn't, it wasn't any religion could save you. It's not the Catholic Church. It's not the Lutheran Church. It's not the Pentecostal Church. And it's certainly not the Baptist Church that's going to save you. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a repentance of your sin, acknowledging that Jesus Christ indeed became a man who died in your place, was buried and rose again the third day for your justification. And when you repent and put your faith and trust in him, God redeems you. He redeems you. Not only does he forgive you of your sin, not only does he put you in, give you peace in your heart and create fellowship, but he's also preparing you for a kingdom that he's about to establish in the future. And so Christ, through his obedience to the will of the Father, has the right, think about this, it speaks of that in this chapter, he has the right to reclaim this world and to reign as its sovereign. When the Bible says that in the garden that the that the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. That's exactly what he's talking about here. See, the serpent got dominion. It was given to him. But one greater than him has come and is going to crush his head at some point in the future. And he's going to establish his right to reign here upon this earth. So one of the reasons, think, think about this, one of the reasons that Israel missed, they missed Jesus during his first advent because when you look at the nation of Israel, they should have been understanding their Redeemer was coming. They should have understood that Jesus was the Redeemer. So why did they miss him? Well, because they weren't looking for salvation spiritually. They were looking for a political leader, a leader someone to establish his kingdom and his throne and, and to establish this prominence that's talked about throughout the Old Testament, that this world ruler is going to come that has the right to the throne of Israel. So they, they were looking for that. What they didn't understand is that before Jesus could become the political leader, he had to deal with the sin of humanity and regain this, this dominion that was taken from us by our fall. So as we think about this chapter, and I want you to just look at this very quickly. And again, I don't know that I'm going to be much longer than where I am right now. So we're going to move pretty quick from this point on. Notice, please, if you would, there's a way to divide this chapter. And if you have a pencil or a pen, you may want to uh, underscore these words here in just a moment. Would you notice, first of all, the, the first phrase in verse number one, and I saw. That's a key phrase. All right, look at it in, again in verse number two, and I saw. Look at verse number six, and I beheld. And then verse number 11, and I beheld. Now those are really keys to the movement here of, of this particular chapter. So as you're reading this chapter and you see those, those phrases, I want you to understand that's not just some in, insignificant or just a way of making a statement. No, no, it's a, it's a way of us drawing attention to something that John saw that's very important in this chapter. So let's notice this chapter. And would you notice, please, in verses 1 through 6, specifically, and really we could go all the way to verse number, verse number 8, but we're going to just go to verse number 6 right now. And I want you to notice, please, there's a focus on a book. I want you to see that in this particular chapter. He, he starts talking about that in, in verse number one. He said, and I saw in the right hand that sat upon the throne. So in verse chapter four, he saw the throne. He saw God on his throne. Now in verse chapter five, verse number one, he said, and I saw him sitting on the throne. He had something in his right hand. And he calls it a book. He said, I saw in him that sat upon this throne a book written on, on the backside, uh, written within and on the backside with seven seals. 
So would you notice, please, there's this focus on the book. So the God of heaven, the Father sitting upon the throne, he has in his right hand this book, and it becomes the focal point of what John's going to see now through verses 1 through 6. It really becomes something he's going to be very, very, in, again, drawn to. And, and, and so would you notice, please, there's the focus on the book, but notice the placement of this book. It's in the right hand of the one who sits upon the throne. Now you may, not, you may think that's somewhat insignificant, but here's what I would challenge you to do. Go through your Bible and, er- and see what the Bible says about God's right hand. The right hand of God is always, think about this, is always a place uh, of great importance. Uh, it, it is, it's in the right hand and in the case this book has great importance and power. It, it speaks of an exalted position, it speaks of power, it speaks of prominence, and it certainly speaks of influence. So the right hand of God, so this book being in his right hand, is a statement about the importance of this book. Now let's talk a little bit about the particulars of this book. Books in John's day weren't like books in our day. So I, I just want you to understand, there's a little bit of a difference, and because as we read this, you say, well, this doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense to me. Most of us are familiar, because many of you have a Bible in church tonight, and if your Bible's like my Bible, it's made of pretty nice paper, and it's bound together, has a, a leather binding on it. Yours might have a vinyl binding. It could, have a, it could have a paper binding on it. It's still the word of God. So we think about books being written on paper, normally white paper with black ink. So we think about books in that regard. Obviously today in this day and age in which we're living, books are a little bit different. Um, now we have electronic books. Whether you like electronic books or not, it is, it is part of what we're dealing with. Some folks may be sitting here tonight, you may not even have a physical Bible. You may be looking at your Bible on your phone. You may be looking at your Bible on your iPad. There are people that criticize that. I'm just glad you have the Word of God with you. That's really, quite honestly, now I, I like a Bible, like a physical Bible to carry, but I'm just telling you that I understand people do that kind of thing today. I'm doing a whole lot more purchasing today of electronic books for my study because as I travel and as I'm, I'm, I don't necessarily have to pack up a bunch of books or copy, copy a bunch of stuff, it, no matter where I go, those books are on my computer and I can, I can do the study that I need to have. So, but, but I want you to understand the books in John's day were different than this kind of book and it certainly wasn't an electronic book. So, so what is he talking about here? Well, books in John's day were a scroll. It was a thin piece of papyrus which is probably some kind of animal skin that had been obviously made very, very flat and, and became uh, uh, something that someone would use a, a quill, probably not a, a ballpoint pen, but would take a, a quill and some ink and would begin to, to pen words upon or write words upon. And then it was rolled up. Think about this. It would be rolled up and then be unrolled. So this book, as the Bible describes it, is a book that was written on the, on the inside, the Bible says, and on the back side. Now, that's very unusual. Quite frankly, most books weren't written on the back side. You know, we oftentimes have a piece of paper, and I, and I realize today, again, that we're doing a lot of word processing, and sometimes you will print on the front side and on the back side. I remember when I was in school and we had to learn uh, you know, cursive, and we had to learn uh, write turn in papers. They said you, know, you can you can write on the front and on the back. If you're taking this test, turn your paper over and write on the back side. And, and, and but in John's day, they didn't do that. Mostly, the papyrus was written out, and it was written on one side. But this book was written on the Bible says on the inside and on the outside. And notice, please, it's sealed. The Bible says here with seven seals. Now, seals indicate something was important was contained in the document. So again, the very description that he gives to us of this book says, hey, look, this is not just some normal book here. This this is not just a a book that someone's read, read, but this is a book of great importance. Uh, The scroller book was, was, think about this, was was rolled up, and then it was kept intact. They would would circle that scroll with some some string or some thin thin, uh, thread or rope, and and then they would seal those threads down that papyrus to, to make a statement that they were that, that it was sealed and, and it was making something. So it, it would bind, it was bound with these cords, and the seals also speak of not just anyone or anyone could uh, anyone or anything could have access to, to this book, but someone who had authority or power had to be able to open it. In other words, this was a, a document that not just anybody could open. And it's pretty obvious from what we read that they were looking for someone to open it. So let's talk about the importance of this book. John is troubled because of the question. Look at the question again in verse number two. He said, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. 
So I want you in your mind, again, I, I don't think, you know, we think about strong angels. We think about strong people. We think about a guy who goes, you know, we, we think about a guy when he, you know, his, he's ripped, got these big arms, and he's got this, you know, this uh, you know, kind of barrel-chested, and, and, and we just think about a strength in that regard. But that's not what this is talking about. Well, this is speaking of an angel that has great authority, great power. This is an angel that, you have to understand that in, in heaven, not all angels are equal. There, there are, there's order in heaven. There are ranks of authority in heaven. So this is a strong angel. This is not just some, some insignificant or just run-of-the-mill angel. This is a strong angel, and he's got this booming voice. And that booming voice thunders through heaven. And notice the question, please. He said with a loud voice, who is worthy to open this book and to loose the seals Thereof. Who is worthy? Not who is willing, but who is worthy. And that's a good question. The, the idea is who has the worth? Who has the authority? Who has the power? Who has the ability or the right to take this book from the hand, the right hand of God and to open it? So this book, as the way it's described, is spoken of, of more than just a book, but it's more of a legal document. I'm going to read a couple of statements, if I may, from some commentaries. It says, quote, legal documents were sealed often with seven seals imprinted with the attestation of seven witnesses. The wax seals would have to be broken to loose the strings beneath them. I talked about the, 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 the scroll being bound up with these strings and then sealed with, the, with these wax seals. They'd have to, the wax seals would have to be broken to loose the strings beneath them, which wrapped the scroll and guaranteed that it had not been opened or thus altered. A man by the name of Dr. Robert L. Thomas explains, this kind of contract was known all over the Middle East in ancient times. It was used by the Romans in the time of Nero, from Nero on. The full contract would be written on the inner pages and sealed with seven seals, then the con content or the, uh, of the contract would be described briefly on the outside. All kinds of transactions were consummated this way, including marriage contracts, rental and lease agreements, release of slaves, contract bills, and bonds. Support also comes from Hebrew practices. The Hebrew document most closely resembling the scroll was a title deed that was folded and signed, requiring at least three witnesses, a portion of the text would be written, folded over, and sealed with a different witness signing each fold. And a large number of witnesses meant the more importance was assigned to this document. So the very description that is given to us that John said, he said, I saw this, this book with these seven seals says to us this is a very, very important uh, aspect. So the question and the search is found in verse number 12, 2. The strong angel is proclaiming who is worthy. And look at verse number 3. And no man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book and neither to look thereon. So when we think about that, the Bible says no man in heaven, nor on earth, nor under the earth. The statement is emphatic. No, not one man or created being. So no man in heaven, whether it be Enoch or Noah or Abraham or Elijah or Elisha, Jeremiah, Peter or Paul, and certainly no angelic being in heaven, Michael or Gabriel, had the ability to, to open this book. They all stand silent and the, as the question is thundered, who is worthy? And no man steps forward because they weren't worthy. No man on earth, all the men that lived here upon the earth, the great men, the statesmen, the orators, the politicians, the champions and the conquerors, they weren't worthy. And no being under the earth, speaking of those who have already died and perhaps are spending their eternity in hell or the demons of hell are found worthy to take this book and open it. I want you to notice, please, John's response to that in verse number four. John is overwhelmed. He said, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Now, John understands that this book dictates the future. He understands the importance of this book that unless someone can open this book that he's kind of at a loss so John, seeing and understanding the significance, he says it moves him to tears. His weeping is much. And I want you to think about this old man. Because John at this time is in his ninth decade of living. 
And he's been through much. He's been, he, he has walked with Jesus Christ. He has, he has suffered for the faith. He has preached the gospel across the face of the Roman Empire. No doubt has been persecuted and, 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 uh, and has already suffered a lot. And at this point, he's weeping because there isn't anyone, any man, who is able to step forward and to take this book and unlock the future. Now I want you to look at, finally at verses 5 and 6 tonight. Because there's a presentation that stops the crying. Would you notice please in verse number five, the Bible says in verse number five, and one of the elders saith unto me, John, John, weep not. Weep not because behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And he said, and I beheld and lo in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as had been slain. Listen to me tonight, there was no man in heaven that could, but there was a lamb in heaven that could. And there's a, there is a, a, a lion in heaven that could. Notice, please, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He hath prevailed. The word means to conquer or to overcome. So as we think about this, Jesus is, again, the central figure of the book of Revelation he appears, think about this, suddenly and dramatically at the center stage of heaven. He comes to claim his rightful inheritance from his father's hand. He is the heir of the divine Jewish royalty, the root of David. He comes with divine authority to receive the title deed to the world and to enact eternal purposes of the God Almighty. Most of us believe, and I believe, that that book is the title deed of his right to set upon the throne. And he is saying, it is mine. I have conquered and I have prevailed and I have the right to rule this world. And I'm telling you, we're living in such a mixed up, crazy world tonight. We have people who are shaking their fists in the face of God and say, we will not live with morality. We will not live by your laws. We will not live by your rules. We will do what we want to. And I want to tell you that's going to continue, and it's going to continue right through the, the, the rapture. It's going to continue right through the, the tribulation period, and it's going to continue as Jesus Christ ascends from heaven to take his right p- position and establish a, a kingdom on this earth. But I want to tell you that when he comes, he has the right to set upon that throne. And I'm telling you, as we think about this today, we have all these people who are so mi- filled with mixed emotions. Well, what right ha- do I have to say that my, my way is the right way. Well, God has the right way, has the right to say his way is the right way. And I, I'm, I'm telling you, as I think about this, I'm, it, just, it, it just makes me so joyful. It, it makes me think about the fact that man before too long, uh, that, that what John describes here is going to happen, and you and I are, are going to be a part and party, part of that if you are saved tonight. Uh, we're we're going to be there when, when he takes that, that book out of the right hand of the Father and he begins to uh, open those seals and he begins to unleash his judgment upon this earth and preparing this world for him to come and take his throne. And it doesn't matter, all the evil in the world doesn't matter. If the Antichrist or all the armies of, of hell will march against him. He will be victorious because he has prevailed. And I, for that I can say glory, hallelujah. I'm glad I'm on the winning side. I'm glad I'm on the right team. You know, you, you, I'm, I'm telling you, if you're saved tonight, you're on the right side of things. And we just need to sit back and let God do his thing. We, we, we're not to sit back and just take it easy. We're, we're to sit back and realize, hey, he's coming. We need to keep busy until he comes. And so I, I just want to encourage you tonight, think about this, that the rest of this book really focuses on Jesus dealing with the rebellion on this earth. I'm telling you, I said a few moments ago, there's evil in our world. There's evil, there's evil in our government. There's evil across the face of this world that says God, God is not gonna do it. They're, in fact, they're, they're so full of themselves, they don't even think there's a God. They, they think they are God themselves. We're gonna find out someday that they're not. By God's grace, I don't relish in that, but I'm here to tell you tonight that we, you and I have a responsibility to try to share the gospel with as many people as we possibly can. But what a moment that's gonna be, isn't it? When King Jesus steps out of heaven and says, I'm coming to establish my throne. And when he takes that old devil, you read about in Revelation chapter 19 and chapter 20, and he chains him and throws him in hell for, all he, for, for a thousand years, what a moment that's gonna be. But until then, until then, I want you to know, if you're saved tonight, you're on the winning side. Don't, don't, think, don't think tonight that evil can win or prevail. They may push back, they may, they may uh, think that they're gonna win, but I'm telling you, we, our, our team is gonna win, and our God is going to reign. 
And John just gets a little glimpse of that, and as we go forward, we're going to see more and more and more of this lion of the tribe of Judah who is going to come and set upon this throne. I hope you're excited about that as I am tonight, because it's a wonderful thought. Let's bow our heads together in prayer as we bring this service to a conclusion tonight.